On behalf of the university, I welcome you to the 2019 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Firstly, I wish to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite, Fabarton and Roseworthy are built. I also wish to acknowledge the Fisher family's continued support of the lecture series. The family were to be represented this evening by Mr. Peter Fisher, the great, great grandson of original donor, Joseph Fisher, but sadly he had to withdraw at very short notice. I would also like to acknowledge the Honorable Catherine Branson, Deputy Chancellor, Professor John Williams, Executive Dean, Faculty of Professions, Professor Kim Anderson, School of Economics, and editor of the Fisher Lecture Series. The proceedings for this evening will commence with our Executive Dean, Professor John Williams, introducing Professor Shawan Anderson, who will deliver the 2019 Joseph Fisher Lecture. Professor Anderson will then take a few questions from the floor before the event is concluded. I now invite Professor John Williams, Executive Dean, to come forward and introduce our 2019 Joseph Fisher Lecturer, Professor Shawan Anderson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth, and it's, uh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I too would like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the land upon which our campuses are built, and I acknowledge their, their leaders, many of which will be coming from this university. Uh, I am very much delighted to be uh, in introducing our speaker, but before I do, I'd like to say a few words about uh, the lecture. I'd also, also like to take my opportunity to acknowledge the Deputy Chancellor, Honourable Catherine Branson, uh, and the two Andersons, the professors. I'd like to also acknowledge their roles too. Thank you. This is a very much a prestigious uh, lecture, and it's tremendous to see uh, colleagues join us here today. The Joseph Fisher Lecture in Economics and Commerce was presented uh, at the University of Adelaide each year since 1904. Now, if you think about that in the context of Australia, I mean, the, the country came into existence in 1901. So it's been an ongoing uh, connection for this, this university. The lecture and the medal for the top student in each year was established with a thousand pounds endowment in 1903 uh, by the prominent Astra Adelaide business person, Joseph Fisher. The University of Adelaide and the School of Economics has been very proud to host eminent speakers uh, including two Prime Ministers, Sir Robert Menzies from Australia and Michael Moore from New Zealand. Uh, and the Nobel Laureate Joseph Stiglitz has also amongst other high profile lecturers. Tonight we're privileged to have Professor Anderson. Uh, professor Anderson is currently the Professor at Vancouver School of Economics at UBC in Canada. Uh, she's a development economist and I've had the privilege of looking at a couple of your lectures on, on YouTube you, uh, in that area. Looking at microeconomic level approaches to institutional and development countries and also gender uh, economics and focusing on women in the economy. And I, I understand today you've also spoken to some of our economists, women economist groups. Uh, I've had a brief word and I, as I was saying, there's probably nothing, there's very few hours left for her to sleep since she's been here. I think we've got it in a seminar for two days coming up and then quickly her back on a plane to teach uh, in Monday back in Canada. Professor Anders is a senior fellow at Canadian Institute of Advanced Research, the Bureau of Research Economics, Analysis and Development, the Theoretical Research Development Economics and the Centre for Effective Global Action at the University of Berkeley. So a very notable speaker. We are very fortunate to have you here today and it, look, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the 2019 Joseph Fisher Lecturer, Professor Anderson. Thank you, please welcome you. Okay, Thank you very much for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so yes, I'm gonna to talk today about uh, missing women and I'll first just uh, introduce the subject. So essentially, you know, since uh, 1979, when this uh, international treaty committed to you know, uh, the end of all forms of discrimination against women, um, empowering women in, in the developing world has been a primary policy goal. 
And it hasn't just been based on a human rights perspective. It's also been on the sort of a work that came out primarily from economics that showed that if you put the money in the hands of a woman versus a man, very different things get spent on. And in particular, women are much more likely to invest in child health and education, which is a very important role uh, in development, of course, human capital accumulation. And the UN Millennium Development Goals, which committed all UN member states in the year 2000 to goals that were going to eradicate poverty in the developing world, made gender one of these main goals for that reason, that gender uh, empowering women can, is a tool for combating poverty, hunger, disease, and even uh, stimulate sustainable development. And since the year 2000, they revised these goals. And since the year 2000, we did achieve this goal of essentially comparable education, universal education levels amongst boys and girls. But we have almost everything else left to achieve still. And it's, it's a primary policy goal. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was sort of huge you know, policy, uh, investing in poli development policy. They just, re just last year devoted, created a big gender strategy um, initiative, you know, millions and millions of dollars going towards it. And because of this policy focus, we've made unprecedented changes you know, in the past te decades and at a pace people thought were, 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 were surprising. Um, so just in terms of basic indicators of, of education, employment, uh, political rights, and, and legal rights are more and more equal across countries. But, it, but still, women and girls continue to suffer discrimination and violence in all forms uh, in the developing world. And so just to give you a rough sense, these are like there's now the UN and, and OECD. They put together these gender indicators, right? So just to give you a broad, so this is sort of on the left is the panel of you know, the developing regions of the world. And you see just basic, these are just basic gender bias social norms like genital mutilation, whether polygyny is accepted, whether your mobility is re restricted in any way. Um, these are all increasing. So things like in you know, countries in West Africa, you saw 50% of women suffering genital mutilation. Polygyny is very accepted in Africa. Um, these are just basic legal rights. So these are indices that are equal to zero if males and females have the same rights and then they increase in discrimination towards women. So one is completely discriminated, you don't have equal rights at all. So for example, in North Africa, you know, widows don't have rights to inherit, daughters don't have rights to inherit, and so forth. But nowhere in the world. So in all these indicators, you usually see the countries in Africa the worse off. West Asia is often poor, uh, poorly off too. And cent cent Latin America and the Caribbean are the best off, but still, women are not protected there either fully. Um, and then it carries on, you know, rights within, within marriage. Again, not equal rights at all. And then just basic indicators like and land ownership. So this is the proportion of women that own any land at all. You can see it's in general less than 20%. Political representation is less than 25. And then literacy. So even though we've achieved, this is like overall literacy in the female population. So we've achieved equality in terms of uh, primary school. But then again, it's the quality of the primary school where they're actually literate. But you see country like, countries in West Africa, it's as low as 31% of overall women are illiterate. But then coming to the topic of this talk is the star perhaps the starkest manifestation of this gender discrimination in the developing world is this notion of missing women. So this was a, coined by the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen in the early 90s. And it's just driven by a simple observation that if you look at Overall sex ratio, so this is just the number of men versus the number of women in a given population. In the developed world, this is always less than one. Okay, so women outnumber men. Essentially, the mortality rate of men is higher than that of women as you age, right? And then if you take countries in the developing world, and he focused in on China and India, which had these very biased sex ratios, it's, it's greater than one, meaning there, men outnumber women. So if we think of the developed country situation is where if is our situation where men and women get the most equal treatment, that's the sex ratio we should see without gender. Is, I mean, of course, there's some gender situation, but that's the best we have. So that without gender discrimination, we should see an overall sex ratio of less than one. Then this is sort of a measure of how many women are demographically missing due to inequality, in unequal treatment. So Sen made a, you know, this was a huge uh, finding in the sense that he, what he did was he, he, put, he quantified this number. So comparing, you just take the sex ratios you should observe in India 
if there weren't uh, gender discrimination. And he came up with this number, which was 200 million missing women. Right? So this was an astronomical number. It caused huge alarm. So these are meant to be just the pure number that have died prematurely due to inequality and neglect. So in other words, if these women had instead been born in India, been born in Australia, they'd be alive today. Right? Um, so this, of course, caused huge alarm policy in the policy world, the academic world. So people started to research this. And they focused very much on excess female mortality in Asia, and mainly in China and India, where you did see these very biased overall sex ratios. And they knew, we know that, and they focused in on the sex ratio at birth, so how many girls per, per boys survived at birth to explain these overall sex ratios. So this research concluded that this reason we're seeing this 200 million missing women is because of sex selective abortion and female infanticide. Um, and then to explain why this is going on, it was just a cultural explanation. Okay, culturally, there's a preference for boys versus girls and, and a lot of reasons for that. So, you know, girls are typically an economic liability. You marry them off to another family. Their, their networks are with that family. And in the, in the Indian context, they cost a lot of money. You have to pay these large dowries. Um, the sons are the ones who inherit the property. They perform the funeral rites. They're economically linked. So essentially, there's a big bias uh, towards boys, in favor of boys. And so the story was, you know, this is the main reason we're seeing these, these missing women. And there were papers to show that, you know, for example, these numbers increased to a degree when access to ultrasound technologies came in, and particularly in the India case. And then if you just look at China, it's a very obvious, so this is um, the one axis is sex ratio, so the number of boys per girl is age zero to four, and then on the the horizontal axis, you have the years. And you see this massive jump in 1980, which is exactly when the one-child policy came in. So they had a one-child policy, and, they were, and then they only wanted boys uh, under that regime. So essentially, you know, and then there's been a lot of policy, a lot of changes to address this uh, problem. So for example, just directly uh, affecting women's economic uh, valuability, they have legal property rights now, there's anti-discrimination laws, and then t tackling this problem directly, you know, prenatal sex selection and sex selection of abortion is illegal, uh, one child policy in China is relaxed if the first birth was a girl, and dowry is illegal in India, but still none of this curtailed the phenomenon, so why are they still missing, okay? Um, I mean, of course, laws aren't typically enforced very well in these environments, but still, then this is where my research stepped in was, well, maybe prenatal sex selection isn't the entire story. Okay, so maybe there is more to the story. So the most of this work I've embarked upon with my co-author, Deborah Jouet, at New York University. So the first thing we did was we decomposed it. So we moved away from looking at these overall sex ratios and broke it up by ages. And then you can see, are they really all missing at birth or is it at older ages? And we also moved away and we started looking at mortality rates by age instead of these sex ratios, which is a bit more accurate measure since we're trying to get sort of excess female mortality. And with this, we came across two key findings. So the first was that they're not all in Asia. So once you do this, once you move away from looking at the overall sex ratios, you find them at, on equal par in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So you see about 2 million a year. Uh, missing in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's very comparable to the Indian numbers. And secondly, they're not all missing at birth, and in fact, a huge majority are missing at adult ages. So 55% of the missing women in China were, a great, were older than 15 years old, 66% in India, and 83% in sub-Saharan Africa. So in other words, the prenatal sex selection, it does go on, but it's not explaining these mass numbers, massive numbers. Um, so this is just showing you the percentages by age, but maybe I won't really get into that right now, but um, uh, just showing you the distribution. So, well, yeah, I think I'll skip that. Okay, so then the reason they weren't, they weren't being found in sub-Saharan Africa in the previous work, because they were looking at these overall sex ratios. And what hid the problem was these sex ratios at birth. So everywhere in the world, there are more boys born per girl. Okay, so, the, so this is the number, so if it were equal, it would be one, right? But in fact, the world average in the developed world is between about 1.06 and 1.07. So everywhere, because partly it comes about because the female fetus is stronger than the male fetus, 
So on average, people have more boys than girls. And then what, what, the reason you, couldn't, you didn't see these biased sex races in sub-Saharan Africa is because there's an ethnic, ethnic uh, genetic difference between this. So essentially, African ethnicities have a lower sex ratio of birth than everywhere else. And this is something that, so if you can see, this is the US uh, statistics by ethnicity. And it's 1.03 for every African, African ethnicity. It's the same in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this is a genetic difference that they noticed in the US Census about 200 years ago, and they're trying to understand. But anyway, it's there. But anyway, as a result, because they start out with these lower sex ratios at birth, so relatively in favor of females, their overall sex ratio doesn't look so bad, but it actually is when you break it up by age. Um, and interestingly, um, you know, this, you see this in the sub-Saharan, the African ethnicities, but also Latin America has a lower one. The indigenous uh, Indian, American Indians also have a lower one. So this is something, you know, demographers study, but it had been overlooked in this literature, and this is why we see it. So then the thing was, uh, so first, if they're not all at birth, then it's certainly just not this simple cultural explanation, okay? So, um, Instead, so the ones that we actually can associate at birth were 11% were in India, which meant 200,000 a year, uh, zero in sub-Saharan Africa, and, 30, and the highest proportion missing at birth was in China. Um, and these are huge numbers and alarming things we should be concerned about, but it wasn't that order of magnitude of 200 million that they had first talked about. So instead, it seems like there's discrimination at all stages of women's lives that play in a role, and probably each region's story is different. So our first step for further research was to look at sort of the geographic distribution. So we first did it by within India. And there the story is that in northern India, people are, there's, way less, there's much more gender discrimination in the south. The missing women were mainly coming out of the north. And again, we find that you know, once you break it up, you don't see that. So this is just starting with the sex ratios at birth. And again, the overall average in India is, depending on the years of data you use, is 1.08 or between 1.08 and 1.07. And first, this isn't that alarming in that, for example, in Northern Europe, you see higher, lower ones in Southern Europe. So in Spain, you'll see, also see 1.07, for example. And we don't think there's any sex selection abortion going on in Spain. And then you see this massive variation. These are the different states. So you do see these, like Haryana and Punjab, have shockingly high, right, 1.35. And that was the sort of the story. But then the ones where you see the lowest, like Assam, which is uh, you know, 1.0 or 1.02, or Madhya Pradesh, these are not uh, southern states. These are in the north. So first you see variation, and also the, the story is, is, hard, is uh, not consistent across the country at all. And then we look at it, so this is just to show you by state at the different ages, and the point is mainly being that it changes, so each state's a different color, that it changes by age, okay? So um, the, that was at birth, and you go from zero to 15. And again, the, the which state is explaining most of the, the bulk of the missing women changes. So it's again, just not a simple story, and there needs to be much more explanation to understand this. So for example, what we did see was consistent with the earlier research is that these missing women at birth were shockingly high in these two northwestern states, and the excess female mortality at all the ages was lower uh, in the southern states, where we think we know there's le less disc gender discrimination. But these regions added up to a, only a total of a quarter of the total of missing women. So essentially, you know, a lot uh, die at adulthood, and, and we don't know why. We did the same thing for Africa, just again, there, the, the previous story was there weren't any at all. Right? So we broke it up by region. So here you have the 0 to 14 young group. And you see the huge proportion in the West African countries. And then East Africa, Southern Africa has very little in the younger age group. And then you go into the older age group, Southern Africa starts explaining some of the proportion. Um, and East, the part explained by the East gets much bigger. And then if you dig in even deeper, you see particular countries are responsible. And this is the, the younger ages. So this is the missing women between ages 0 and 14. You see certain countries are very responsible. So for example, Somalia there, Chad, uh, um, Central African Republic, and so forth. And then if you move to the older age groups, it's a different story. It moves a bit more into the southern part of Africa. 
Um, so then our next step was, okay, well, we've seen that there's no easy story. Can we, can we, decide, can we figure out which diseases and causes of death are most responsible? So now we're trying to figure out which uh, actual cause of death. And what you see is, so for the, for the younger ages, so we have a lot of missing women, about 300,000 a year in each of India and Sub-Saharan Africa, and they're missing, they're missing between ages zero and four from preventable diseases. Okay, so one is uh, diarrhea-related diseases, which are all sani you know, due to poor sanitation, or vaccine-preventable diseases. In the, in the Sub-Saharan Africa case where malaria is prevalent, you have 150,000 missing girls from malaria. So then the question is, because this is meant to be a story of discrimination, is that what's explaining this? You know, are there, or instead are there some biological uh, differences and so forth? In the, for, and maternal deaths, so this is not a discrimination, discriminatory story, sort of men versus women, this is just poor female health, okay? So 15% of the missing women in India and Sub-Saharan Africa are due to just dying in childbirth. So the risk of dying in childbirth is one in 20 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Typically, you know, they're bleeding to death, and really it's because there's no skilled attendant present. They're just in these villages, there's someone helping them out, but, and risk is also higher with genital mutilation, which we saw is quite prevalent in many countries in Africa still. And then for the case of India, uh, because we're looking, we're looking at cause of death data, the WHO has these injury sort of category, and India is the only place in the world where we saw more women die than men from fire-related deaths. So we estimated about 100,000. So this we're linking, I mean, your work is sort of more directly related, but we're linking uh, to the, the phenomenon of dowry. So there you, they pay these excessive marriage payments to marry off their daughters. You know, it can be up to six times the annual wealth of the family. Often the, they, they marry their daughter and then they can't, they can't afford the entire payment at marriage. They have to sort of sort of reap what, they, what they're owed, and so they often will torture the bride, typically with a fire, so that they can say to the authorities that she hurt herself in a kitchen fire. So uh, the crime statistics will put a much lower number, but this is, we suspect that's what's going on here, because it's the only place you see excess female mortality from this specific cause, which is fire. And likewise, in China, you see this, uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon of 100,000 missing women due to suicide. And there, again, it's the only place in the world where women are more likely to commit suicide than a man. Um, and this, you know, this one estimate coming out is that one, in, one woman kills herself every four minutes in China, and this is typically in the rural areas, and they're ingesting pesticide to uh, end their lives. And then finally, we had the HIV epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa, and there you have 800,000 missing women. And this is, again, the only place in the world where women are more likely to die from HIV uh, than uh, men. So, ever, so everywhere else in the world, including all developed and all deve other developing areas, women, men are more likely to have, four times more likely to have HIV. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's the opposite. Um, it's the women. So the, uh, there, the young adult women comprise 75% of the population living with HIV. So then the question is, you know, why are we seeing this? So we thought, they thought it was just a preference for sons that was driving it. Why are we seeing this unequal treatment, this gender discrimination at the older ages? Um, you know, is it possible they're giving, they take the woman to the man to the hospital or get medical care for the man and not the women? And then a natural first step for us was to think about widowhood. So mortality is very high. Men die at a faster rate, so women are left widowed. And particularly in, in the developing country context, everyone marries at a young age. So if you're unmarried at an older age, you're a widow. And we know that widows are incredibly discriminated against. So then we thought maybe this is explaining why we're seeing all, so many missing women at older ages. So our next step was try to compute uh, how to do this. Okay, so we start with the premise that essentially everywhere in the world, widows, or the unmarried, die earlier than the married. Okay, so marriage protects you from premature mortality. Um, and this is true at all ages, for both genders, all across the developed world. It's something that's been studied for a long time in demography, first studied in the 1800s in France. Um, and, you know, it's sort of a known thing, this widowhood effect, that if you're the survivor, if your spouse dies, you die earlier than someone else who hasn't lost their spouse. Um, and it, you know, it makes sense in terms of marriage provides you with you know, 
uh, significant economic, psychological, and environmental benefits, involves two people caring for each other. But anyway, it's the statistics is known for a long time. And it's, there's less data and good, reliable good data on this in developing countries, but what we do know, it certainly goes on. And what you have there is a much higher proportion of widows. And you imagine this sort of more premature mortality rate that these widows face is probably even more extreme there. So that could explain, because all these computations is doing is all relative to um, men and what's happening in developing versus a developed situation. Um, and so, and it, these, there's very extreme examples of gender discrimination by widowhood in the South Asian context, probably maybe you're already familiar, but essentially you, you're losing the women, it's the women who are left behind, they're losing the main breadwinner of the, the family, they don't have protection of property or resources, um, they're not allowed to return to their, they're typically women marry, or, you know, they, they leave their village, marry into another village, they're not allowed to return back to their natal village if they lose their husband. And then there's actually very strong customs of isolation. You have to eat a certain food. You have to dress a certain way. And the most extreme that you may infamous that's not very widespread anymore was sati, where you actually were, you know, burned on the, the cremation pier of your husband. Uh, you burned yourself. Anyway, so it's no small matter. There are about 50 million missing, or 50 million widows in India. And then a similar plight in Africa. So they're very, they're ostracized. They also have these laws of isolation. And also actually there, they even link it to witchcraft. There's these witch, witch killings because they're often there are these customs that when someone dies, there's a reason for it. Someone's to blame. They often blame the wife if it's the husband. So given these ex hugely extreme vulnerabilities, both social, economic, and so forth, you can imagine maybe this is explaining you know, a big part of our missing women puzzle. Um, and this is, I won't get into these graphs, these are just showing you uh, that, these are just indeed showing you that the relative rate of widowhood is much higher in developing countries and this uh, mortality from widowhood is, um, so I won't get into those. But this is, so then we compute, you know, how much of these missing women at older ages can be explained by widowhood and for the Asia context, it's a big part of the story in India, um, but not as much very little in China, not much in West Asia, and, if, and a bit more in South Asia. And then we find uh, for Africa, that it's a big part of the story for East Africa. And if you recall from when we did the regional breakdown, the biggest chunk of missing women is actually in West Africa. But this is explaining a huge chunk of the East Africa. So there's something going on but, uh, with those customs, and the customs of ostracization and so forth are probably stronger in the East African countries. So then um, the question is, um, what time am I supposed to stop? <laughs> In about half oh, okay, I'm going really fast, so it's okay. I'm mean, gonna have lots of time for questions. Okay, so then the question is, um, you know, what, what sort of mechanisms could be at play? So this is just sort of a raw correlation of, you know, on one side you have these missing women, this is just African countries of these missing women. And then on the other side, we've got on the horizontal axis, we have GDP per capita. So this is actually showing you there's no straightforward correlation with poverty, right? So in, if anything, this graph showing you it's positive. Um, and then if we instead break it down by the poor countries, so this is lower than the median, um, the, what, the set of countries that are below the median G, uh, income per capita, then you do see a slight negative relationship, meaning as the countries get a bit richer, the excess female mortality or the missing women starts to fall a little bit. But there's not a super obvious correlation at all with just straightforward poverty story. But then if you look at mortality rates, so there's certainly a very positive correlation. So the more, the higher just overall adult mortality rates are, so that's along this axis, then you see many more excess missing women, okay? So the higher mortality countries, you do see uh, higher numbers of missing women. And then you see that particular diseases are responsible. So for example, just the diarrhea-related diseases, the prevalence of them. So they're, they're, the more prevalent, prevalence, more higher mortality rates just overall from diarrhea-related diseases, you're gonna see ex higher missing girls 
Um, similarly, for HIV prevalence, you're going to see higher missing women of the adult ages and uh, higher malaria, the same thing. So this is just to say there's not a clear thing, clear correlation with poverty levels and GDP as a measured by GDP per capita, but there is a strong correlation with just particular disease prevalence and uh, mortality rates. And that's also we haven't found in the general literature, we haven't been able to say there's a strong correlation with GDP per capita and just overall mortality. That hasn't been very well established either. Um, so there are just very uh, specific stories with regards to disease. So then the question is, you know, why are we seeing this? So first, we see particular diseases are responsible. Why? Right? So is it the case that, um, you know, it's, and we can't answer that really. I mean, it's, it, there's could be biological, social, environmental, behavioral, economic, and so forth. Huge amount of factors leading to this. Um, and when I got into this research, I was surprised that the medical literature hasn't they don't focus on these sort of big gender differences because this, this change in the fact that women die at a f slower rate than men now in the developed world, that only happened around 1900 in the developed countries. And this transition um, is partly due to the, the disease components. We used to die of different things, which is what people die of now in the developing world. These sort of more communicable diseases, infectious diseases versus non-communicable like heart disease and cancer. So, but there's very, so it's obvious that women were dying at a more equal rate uh, from these other diseases. There's very little research trying to explain that. So anyway, so for example, are there possibly just biological differences? Okay, so for example, we just take malaria. Uh, malaria control is threatened by this sort of rapid development of spread of anti-malarial drug resistance. Could there be a gender component to this drug resistance? And we don't know them. There's no medical literature to say. Um, acute respiratory infections, which explains uh, more so in China than elsewhere of the missing women. In developed countries, we do know that, that, that it's more severe in males than females, so could it be the opposite for some reason in parts of Africa or China, um, protect, per, perhaps lower relative protective immunity? So that would drive these sort of just these inherent biological differences. Um, for example, HIV, the huge number is there. There is a genetic difference, so women in it, because in HIV is being transmitted in sub-Saharan Africa by heterosexual relations, we know that women are more susceptible to catching H or contracting HIV in that situation. But epidemiological models have worked on this, and there's no way it's predicting these kind of numbers. So the biological numbers cannot predict this huge amount of excess female mortality from this. Um, then there's this basic treatment, but gender bias treatment that can be part of the story. So for example, malaria, the way it's prevented is you treat mosquito nets and indoor spraying. Um, resource constrained households could be putting the mosquito nets on the boys' beds and not the girls' beds. Um, so there's evidence that you know, people give the vaccines to the boys versus the girls. Similarly, diarrhea related disease is treated just with solution of uh, clean water, um, sugar and salt. Is it possible you're treated, giving the clean water to the boys and not the girls? Um, this could explain these, uh, these differences. Um, and just female autonomy. So we know that women, right? So women are the ones making the, are investing in the child health. Again, women don't have a lot of bargaining power in the households. And just a basic thing like breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is hugely protective for for children for contracting diseases, and yet you go to eastern southern Africa, only 40% of babies are actually breastfed. Um, so you, do, you know, they're just, the women have to work instead, they don't have time for this. So that's part of the problem, and uh, there is evidence, a paper from India, showing that women are more likely to breast, breastfeed a boy versus a girl. Um, and then there's just cultural factors. So for example, just the fact I showed you that incidence in one of those tables, maybe I went through it too fast, but of early marriage, the proportion of girls marrying at a young age. So there's statistics on whether it's you know, less than 18 or less than 15. And certainly if you're pregnant, so you're getting pregnant early because you're marrying early, you're more susceptible to malaria as a, as a pregnant woman. So that could explain it partly. So 12% of girls in sub-Saharan Africa are marrying even before the age of 15, and then rates of child marriage are exceptionally high, you know, about 30% in places like Niger, Central African Republic, and Chad, and that's exactly where you see this excess female mortality or missing women from malaria at that age. So just that cultural norm could be causing part of the problem. Um, and then just traditional cultural factors like religious factors where, you know, you need one surviving son. We've talked about it in China and India, but it's also the case in sub-Saharan Africa in part. 
Um, in some areas, you know, when you're particularly resource constrained, boys get the food, girls have to eat the leftovers. And as I said, in India, there already is evidence that they're more likely to breastfeed the girls and also more likely to vaccinate the boys. So then just showing you these, these basic correlations between these biased cultural norms. So this is the prevalence of early marriage. And you see a strong positive correlation between that and uh, missing women. This is all using the Africa data. Um, similarly, susceptible to whether the, how much domestic violence, there's not such a clear relationship. I mean, it's a little bit positive. And then this is genital mutilation. And again, there's some positive correlation, but I wouldn't put too much weight on this, but there's a little bit. And then there's a question of just whether legal uh, rights. So these are protection against uh, discriminatory marriage law practices. There's a little bit of a positive correlation. Um, and then discriminatory violence law, a little bit more of a positive correlation, so it explains a little bit, and uh, property rights law. But in general, this work on missing women has sort of opened up kind of more puzzles than, than explained things. So I'm going to end it and sort of end the talk with more uh, a work I've done, which is a little bit more positive, a bit more proactive, which is sort of is trying to uh, show whether increasing property rights of women could improve, in this case, uh, lessen their susceptibility to HIV. So as I've said, so as I focused, you know, that it's the, Sub-Saharan Africa is the only place in the world where women are more likely to have HIV. So for adults, it's through three times more likely than men to have HIV. For the younger cohort, 15 to 24, it's eight times. So this is an alarming phenomenon. It's been deemed the feminization of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, there, typically, you're contracting HIV through heterosexual um, contact. And male HIV rates there are very much linked to risky sexual behavior, like multiple sex partners and so forth. Um, but the very high endemic areas, which is the east and southern part of the continent, they're characterized by these disproportionately higher uh, HIV rates uh, for younger women relative to their male counterparts. Um, so, and, and UNAIDS, who has a lot of data on this, on this subject, they estimate that for more than 80% of these women, they're getting HIV from their husbands, okay? And so the, the role of concurrent sexual partners is a big uh, play, big role, has a big uh, explanatory role in this. So men are five times more likely to report extramarital affairs. An epidemiological model can show you how just one sex worker with HIV could actually affect a uh, huge proportion of the monogamous women, women in monogamous marriages. Um, so then the thing is, so then my conjecture in this is that women, their men are coming home with HIV, they've contracted from an extramarital affair. The, it's whether the women can negotiate safe sex in the household. And then I focus on this power relations. So these power relations, so if they have more power within their household bargaining, they can negotiate safe sex. Um, and this is sort of a, a framework we use in economics. It's called the household bargaining model. And it's, and it's, pr it's been empirically proven uh, many ways. So you see this. So if women, uh, uh, so I'll just go through here first. Well, anyway, so, that, so what I do is I look for something that can affect women's bargaining power in the household and see if that in turn is affecting HIV rates. So what I look at is the formal, just basic formal laws. So in, in, in Africa, you either adopted the, legal or, you adopted the legal origins of your former colonists. So if you're a British colony, you have common law. If you're a continental European colony, you have civil law. And it turns out that traditionally, those two laws had very different property rights for women. So you no longer see that in the developed country context. We've had tons of reform to marital law, particularly after the 60s, but this didn't happen at all in Africa. 60s was a time when they were gaining their dependence. They weren't debating you know, marital law and so forth. So essentially, you have very different uh, property rights for women, and civil law in particular in sub-Saharan Africa is much more superior for women. So essentially, traditional civil law gives you joint ownership of property within the marriage across the, the wife and the husband. And on top of, on top of it, if the marriage ends, it gives you equal property rights. Property is just divided up 50-50. So women leave a marriage with, with property ownership. This is in contrast to the traditional common law where they had no rights to property. They're not protected if they, if they're, if they don't if for, in, at all. Um, 
essentially they have no legal rights to joint property. They're not, it's not acknowledged the work they do in the family business or, or on the farms and so forth. So they have much weaker property rights under the common law uh, system. And what you can show is that the women in the common law countries of Africa have much higher HIV rates and also are much less likely to use safe sex contraception methods. So this is very consistent with how we think about bargaining power in this economic framework where we think if you, can if you can leave the house with property, you can say, okay, I'm leaving this marriage, then you, you're, you, then you can bargain with your husband because you always have this threat, I'm going to leave if you don't agree with me, right? And so this, reduce, so, so this allows you to be more, have stronger bargaining power in the household, you're more able to negotiate safe sex, which reduces your vulnerability to HIV. And this is exactly what you find, I find in this paper, in this, in the, is that female HIV rates are 25 to 50 percent higher in common law countries. So that means that just simple marital property reform, if it happened in sub-Saharan Africa, as happened already in the developed countries, you'd have three million fewer women living with HIV. And, how, and you can test this also just with the, this data I have access to. You, you actually know what contraception method they're using and you focus on whether they use these contraception methods which require some consent from the man. Okay, so whether it's a condom, abstinence, or something like that. And coincidentally, those are exactly the ones that protect you from HIV, the ones that women can control themselves, like the pill, injections, sterilization, and so forth. They don't protect you from HIV. And then what you see is in the common, the common law countries, they're much less likely to use these uh, protective ones. So that's just, uh, so just in terms of, I think this, the missing women research has opened up more puzzles than probably uh, that I haven't solved the puzzles. There's generally no easy explanation. There's many factors at play. On the more positive note, government policy intervention can, could have a very big impact. And just one last thing to mention, so Latin America doesn't come up in terms of a developing region with these sort of excess female deaths from uh, diseases or missing women, missing girls at birth, but it is now the most dangerous place in the world to be a woman in terms of violence. So there's this uh, notion of femicide, um, and this is violence from domestic violence. You're 50 percent, you know, 50 percent of women have suffered domestic violence, but also there gets, there's tons of, it's the most violent place to be a woman out of a conflict zone, and this is a, a big part of what people are trying to understand now. So governments are trying to deal with it. They're thinking that, you know, trying to introduce apps and so forth on the phones for women to be protected in this situation. But this is a big thing that didn't come up in the earlier research, but it's a very important issue to think about. And there's also way, it's very hard to get data on this kind of thing, much harder than actual deaths from diseases and so forth. Okay, it's all in there. Yeah. Thank you. So a fascinating talk. It's raised many questions, and I'm going to open it to the floor for a discussion. Now, if people would like to ask any questions, certainly. Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, as you said, you know many questions come from from these findings. Uh, so from the bargaining power, you know, uh, there's been studies that uh, or projects that have implemented interventions to improve human empowerment and have resulted in more inter-household. Yes. I think, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of, you know, the change of, you know, of men might uh, I mean, people are trying. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, even Bill, the Gates Foundation has an initiative on that. Um, I know people trying to, so there's actually a paper, or an interesting paper in economics, which was on, in the Saudi Arabia case, where they actually, in that case, they just asked men, do you think, you know, your wife should work, right? And, and, in general, the younger, the younger population of men were kind of open to it. But then you ask them, do you think society, your society or your community thinks women should work? And they completely underestimated that number, right? So on the one hand, they're saying their personal opinion. So say 50% of men said, yeah, yeah, my, my husband, can, my, I'm happy with my wife working. 
Then they said, well, what do you think your community thinks? And they said 20%. So then they did this intervention where they said, hey, do you know your community thinks 50%? And then that changed the norms. So they're trying things like that. People are doing apps, like reminders of like, and trying to intervene with a lot of, a lot of information things like, uh, People are doing little movies or vignettes or trying to change it, yeah. Um, and there is also work that came out of uh, economics work just on female political representation. That So they had the, you know, these forced quotas and that they actually are having an impact. Men are changing their perceptions. and No, it's crucial. But how to do it is hard. Yeah, but people are trying, yeah. of mobile phones has changed a lot of practices across the world, especially in developing countries. And I'm just wondering if anyone's thought of undertaking any analysis of who has access to the mobile phone and does that actually uh, uh, sustain current power imbalances uh, between men and women or does, is, it, is it the case that women are also getting access to mobile phones equally so is that changing the dynamics that are operating in society? Yeah, I mean, it's matter. So essentially, one thing is everyone has a phone in the developing world, which is so it's become something that people are trying to use a lot to improve. So as I just sort of alluded to, so with the domestic violence, they're trying to put, especially in Latin America, the government's involved in putting these apps on. So first, you have to hide it from your husband, right? But you start, there's the obvious one where you quickly hit a crisis number or just the police, but there's these other ones where you can put three contacts on. So those, you just hit that button, three contacts will know you're in a violent situation. So it's trying to use apps and use the mobile phone for that. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that just devoted this huge amount of money for gender. The third, there are only three things they want to invest in and one is financial inclusion. And this is trying to think of, so they're using the phones for mobile money because these women can't get access to money. Uh, so you try and use the mobile money through the phones. Um, and that's the next big thing. So it was microcredit for a long time, these microcredit loans, trying to give women, that was, women were a target of that, but that has not been, had huge impacts. And now the next biggest thing is financial inclusion and they'll be using the phones for that. But we're do, it's happening right now. So there aren't huge results on that, but these apps are being tested. And a lot of these apps are already very present. So yeah. Um, I haven't, uh, no, I haven't done a huge amount on that. I mean, partly it's because of the, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't done a huge, uh, directly. I mean, it's hugely important. I've done other work on that, but not directly related to the, I mean, particularly, the, the thing is you find that, that a lot of, like in the Indian context with the, the missing, the sex ratios at birth, they were actually even more biased amongst the very wealthy. Partly they have access to the ultrasound, so then in that sense it's going to get correlated with the education because the wealthy have the more, ed more educated women as well. So it's hard to, you have to figure out a way to uncover all these things. Um, but certainly education is a primary goal uh, of, of, you know, women can make their own decisions if they're educated and, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we have a question. Yeah, um, I'm curious about the, the actual definition of missing women. So. Um, you know, are they literally missing and unaccounted for, or is that because of poor governance and, and uh, improper police investigations and that sort of thing? Or is, is it multifaceted, the definition, in terms of, um, you know, uh, unexplained deaths, as you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, it came about really just, so we have very poor data on crime and, and deaths. So it really came about as just looking at data we have that's reliable, right? So, in that, so the sex ratios are a very reliable indicator. Um, so that, that's how it came. It was really just look at this reliable data. Why, why is this so different? Why are we seeing such different sex ratios? And then the explanation that came up was, there, well, these women are actually just wouldn't, would be alive if they were born somewhere else. So then what's the explanation? But missing women is just this, they are just demographically missing. And it's based on this data on sex ratios. And then we moved to, when our work, we moved to relying on actual death rates by age. 
And so the, the challenge we have of convincing people of our numbers is people have to believe that death data, which people don't believe all the time. So you're up against which statistics, who believes what statistics, but we're relying on a new source, this Global Burden of Disease Study, which is doing very, very careful estimates. But it's really just mortality rates. You can't rely on, you can't, you can't rely on the crime stats. You can't rely, you know, to get uh, well, for the same. Mortality rates um, in, in, in that context are not women that have disappeared, maybe alive. It's definitely uh, fatality. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, yeah, and it's all computed relative to men. So you're, you're assuming a way that, so you're dealing with the fact that these are, these people are in the same disease environment, the same poverty levels. It's relative to the death rates of where you live. And then again, relative to what you would see in a developed country and the same ages. That's how you're, it's all relative. So it's just these sort of, another way to think about it is just excess mortality, excess female mortality. It's fascinating how the developing world and the, and the developed world are kind of, you know, it's flipped data, isn't it? Uh, where it's kind of opposite um, ratios. Yeah. No, it's very, uh, yeah. And so we, I mean, our first hypothesis was it was the epidemiological transition. So because as you move, as you develop, you move from dying of infectious communicable diseases to non-communicable, like heart disease. And so that's why we computed it by disease. So, so by doing that computation, I can tell you what disease they're dying from. But also, we thought it would go, the epi, we wouldn't find them once we controlled for disease, but we do. So in other words, the epidemiological transition explained very, we had a way to compute it, explained like 5% of it. So it's not just a pure disease. The fact that they're dying from different things is not what is driving that. So, yeah. And the final question. Okay. Um, in places like Haryana and Punjab, finding girls to marry is difficult. People yeah, are yeah. Going away. I remember talking years ago to the Indian economist uh, Dharma Kumar, who said, at some point, supply and demand must cut in. Yeah. Why doesn't it? Um, well, the, I mean, overall, so, well, what can happen first is that <coughs> men marry younger women, right? So any time there's population growth, if, if you're going to have more women than men, right? So then essentially, if you start killing some of those women off, you can still get enough women to marry. And then if you lower the age yet again, it's called this marriage squeeze, it's this demographic phenomenon. If you, if you increase that marriage cap again, you're willing to marry even younger women, you can keep the, you don't have to worry about it so much. So in places, so it's not an overall, it is a big problem in China though. So they're bringing uh, women in from, all, from other countries to marry or they're, or they're remaining unmarried. And similarly in India, it's coming from, they're marrying women from elsewhere, but it's not as extreme. But yeah, there's been estimates that there's 25 million men need to find looking for wives in, in China. And that's a huge social problem on its own, yeah. Un, unmarried so men. <laughs> bride, bride props. Yeah, then that's not happening. Yeah, you, you, it could. The balance of marriage payments should change. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to bring it to an end there. I'd like to thank okay. you for a fascinating talk. Okay, thank you very talk. much. I think yeah. we'd all like Thank you, Professor Anderson. <laughs>